There have been title victories in mixed martial arts that felt like paradigm shifts. Like this champion was about to take the sport in a new direction. Anderson Silva, George St. Pierre, and John Jones all come to mind. These new champions, their wins felt bigger than a title change. It felt like we were witnessing the beginning of something truly special. And while those examples I just mentioned are great, there's been a whole bunch of times that feeling was just dead wrong. No! We thought the next big thing had arrived, and they hadn't. So today we're going to be taking a look at 10 champions who had all the hype in the world after taking the throne, only to come up very short, very fast. I'm Tommy from MMA On Point, and these are 10 promising champions who never successfully defended their titles. Hey. Number 10, Robert Whittaker. This is absolutely the weirdest situation on our list because it feels like Robert Whittaker had a welterweight title reign, but in reality, the first time he ever even fought for undisputed gold is when Israel Adesanya defeated him at UFC 243 and ended his reign. After struggling in his early UFC career at welterweight, Bobby Knuckles made the move up to 185 pounds and would rattle off six victories straight with four finishes, putting away names like Uriah Hall, Derek Brunson, and most impressively at the time, Jacare Souza. This would lead to an interim title fight with Yoel Romero at UFC 213. Since the champion Championship situation was a bit hazy as Michael Bisbee awaited his bout with George St. Pierre. You still drunk right now? Are you still drunk? Oh, what, what, what's no, going on? No, but I'm gonna go. <laughs> what, the, what is going on with him? Despite being seriously injured during the fight, Whitaker would earn the UD over the Cuban monster and interim gold. That would be upgraded to the real deal after GSP retired following his defeat of Bisbee. What should have been his first undisputed title defense was instead a fight for nothing when Bobby rematched Romero almost a year after their first encounter since Yoel missed weight. Another hard fought victory over arguably the scariest fighter in the division, of course had fans giving Whitaker the respect he deserved, despite the fact the belt wasn't on the line. The meteoric rise of Adesanya was unexpected, as was his dismantling of the champion. And while Knuckles earned his way to a second shot at Stylebender this year, he came up short a second time. This is a tough case of being the right guy at the wrong time. Number 9. Frank Mir He's one of those mythical MMA figures. Frank Mir without the motorcycle accident. What might that time period in the sport have looked like if everything wasn't ripped away from him in an instant. Mir was about as hot as any heavyweight in the sport. 7-1 as a pro, 5 wins in the UFC with 4 finishes. He was a submission machine. He was going to get you down and take a limb home with him. <laughs> Jedi business, go back to your drinks. At just 25 years old, he snapped Tim Sylvia's arm in half in the very first round at UFC 48 to become the new undisputed heavyweight champion. He was awarded a black belt after his win. Frank Mir was the future. Unfortunately, though, he wouldn't see the cage again after that night for nearly two years, forcing the UFC to strip his title. A few months after the victory, Mir got hit by a car while on his motorcycle and broke both his legs. He also completely shredded one of his knees. Doctors told him his MMA career was probably over, and so Frank began to drink heavily. Despite all of this, he would defeat the booze and recover, looking sloppy and bad in a fight he should have dominated against Marcio Cruz. Instead, he would be TKO'd in the first round. Now, of course, Mir would go on to be an all-time great heavyweight in the division, but he would never recapture undisputed gold despite working his way to two more attempts. The question of how long Mir might have remained champion during that era had he not been in the accident is one we'll unfortunately never have the answer to. Number 8. Rashad Evans Everything about Rashad Evans indicated he was the next next big thing at light heavyweight and in mixed martial arts in general. He had a well-rounded game and was exciting. He was young and charismatic. I mean, just drop Rashad and just call myself Sugar. All right, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Came into his first ever title challenge, 12-0-1, with seven UFC victories. He had won the Ultimate Fighter season two. He went to a draw with former champion Tito Ortiz. He knocked out former champion Chuck Liddell on his way to his title shot. Rashad Evans was on fire, and he would be going up against one of the most popular names in the sport at the time, Forrest Griffin, whose Cinderella rise to the championship only endeared him even more to the fans. I remember going to a jam-packed Hooters to watch Evans versus Griffin, legitimately standing room only, and the place was filled like a rock concert. Absolutely absurd when I look back at it now, but that was how big that fight was. Griffin and Evans, both tough winners, the show that got most of those fans into that Hooters. It was huge. And when Rashad TKO'd Forrest, the place exploded. It felt like such a moment. This was the changing of the guard. Guys like Chuck, Tito, and Randy had their time, and Evans had just proved he was the best of the new batch. Then he got Rashad faced the very next fight against Lyoto Machida. How? What? It's over. No. 
please. That's not how these narratives are supposed to go. Ironically, the Machida era that was declared after the win would last just about as long. Despite working his way back to the top in the next few years, teammate John Jones would keep Rashad from reclaiming the throne. Number seven, Cody Garbrandt. From unranked to world champion in just a year's time, it's one of the most incredible rises the sport has ever seen. And given how godlike Cody Garbrandt looked when he took the title from Dominic Cruz, I don't think anybody could have possibly anticipated that that would be his only ever title victory. Entering the UFC at five and oh, Cody would rattle off a couple wins in 2015, but failed to break into the top 15. He would next KOTKO three straight opponents in the first round to go from a prelim fighter to a title challenger. And he would do so against the bane of Team Alpha, Dominic Cruz, the arguable greatest bantamweight of all time, who had taken the title from his former teammate, TJ Dillashaw. While there was plenty of hype over Garbrandt's power and speed, he still entered UFC 207 at two to one dog. I mean, sure he was good, but this was Dom Cruz we're talking about. Over the course of those five rounds though, with Cody doing nearly anything he wanted for the majority of the fight, seemingly untouchable at times, even dancing mid-bout, the promise of his title reign became very apparent. He was this young guy who just did to Cruz what none of us had ever seen. If he could do that to the best, who could possibly stop him? TJ Dillashaw, it would turn out. The two would have their blood feud next over TJ leaving the camp. He just lies on top of the Who's the ones are making up stories over here? And twice in a row, Dillashaw would finish Cody. He would follow up his title defeats by getting TKO'd by Pedro Munoz, and he's lost five of six since the Cruz victory falling from the top nearly as quickly as he reached it. Number six, Johnny Hendricks, the man who beat George St. Pierre. At least that's how a lot of people saw UFC 167's main event welterweight title fight, but that's merely a piece of the puzzle that made Johnny Hendricks seem like he was the next big thing. He would amass 10 UFC victories before his first title challenge, and along the way defeat some impressive names like Carlos Condit and Josh Koscheck. What got people excited about the D1 wrestling standout though, was that he had cinder blocks in his hands. Martin Campman out cold. John Fitch. John Fitch out in 12 seconds, and I mean out. The hype was real going into his GSP fight because here was a guy who could seemingly put it all together. He had the wrestling required to compete with St. Pierre, and he also had the power to put him away. After the devastating decision loss, fate would smile upon Big Rig as the welterweight champ would take time away and thus vacate the title. This put Hendrickson about with the resurgent Robbie Lawler at UFC 171, and it seemed as if the universe had corrected its mistake. Johnny would win via unanimous decision, a new era had begun at welterweight. That was until the very next fight when Hendricks and Lawler rematched, resulting in another nail-bitingly close fight not going Johnny's way. Despite beating Matt Brown in his follow-up, Hendricks' career would spiral, in large part due to all the complications he had cutting weight. He would lose five of his next six and miss on the scales a whole host of times before finally retiring in 2018, his title reign merely transitional despite all of his promise. Number five, Mark Coleman. If you had just shown me a picture of Mark Coleman in 1996, I just said, oh yeah, nobody's beating that guy ever. I mean, you look like the fucking Incredible Hulk. <laughs> The guy was a D1 national championship wrestler. He was on the Olympic team. He won the UFC 10 and 11 tournaments in his first two nights as an MMA fighter, and he beat guys like Don Fry and Gary Goodrich. With his innovative ground and pound style, it really looked like this guy was it. And after defeating the legendary Dan Severn at UFC 12 with a damn scarf hold in less than three minutes to become the first ever heavyweight champion in the promotion, it looked like the sky was the limit. This guy and his style of fighting was the future of mixed martial arts. Turns out we were slightly wrong about that. The future of mixed martial arts was Maurice Smith, who despite struggling with grapplers in his early career coming from a kickboxing background, teamed up with Frank Shamrock to become a well-rounded cross-trained fighter. And it was that style instead that would show up Coleman in his first title defense at UFC 14. Smith was able to neutralize his game and completely exhaust the champion on his way to a unanimous decision victory. The stunning defeat was followed up by an even more shocking head kick KO loss in his next outing against Pete Williams. Following a close loss to Pedro Hizo, the hammer was off to Japan and wouldn't return to the UFC for a decade. While he would cement his legacy in the sport by winning the Pride 2000 Openweight GP, the promise and hype of his initial UFC title reign could never be matched in the rest of his career. Number four, Luke Rockhold. If there was ever a fighter who so clearly looked like he was gonna be the man, it was Luke Rockhold. Coming into his fight with Chris Weidman at UFC 194 for the middleweight title, he was 14 and two, he'd gone unbeaten in strike force and held their 185 pound title. On his way to UFC gold, he'd TKO'd Costas Philippou, subbed Tim Bosch, Michael Bisping, and Leoto 
Cheetah, the only blemish in his entire career was losing the TRT Tour, and who could fault anyone for that? The man was Super Shredder in real life. Rockhold seemed infinitely confident, perhaps cocky, something that might end up being to his detriment, foreshadowing. He looked like a million bucks. This was the guy, and he proved that when he finished Weidman in the fourth round of their fight despite battling a staff infection. He defeated the champion who defeated the greatest champion ever. It was full steam ahead on the Luke train with the first stop being a rematch with Chris, a bout that would only further solidify his place at the top of the division. Of course, that didn't happen though. Instead, a late replacement Michael Bisbean would shatter the champion's whole world in the first round at UFC 199, and wow did things change from there. Having admittedly underestimated his opponent, it looked like Rockhold would regroup and maybe get a second chance at that title. But that would not happen. Luke would be sidelined for over a year, then following a win over David Branch, he would get a shot at interim gold against Yoel Romero, but was viciously KO'd. From there, he would fade from relevance, taking over a year off again before returning at 205 pounds, only to be KO'd by Jan Blahovich. Rockhold hasn't fought since 2019. Number 3. BJ Penn It was the stunner of all stunners, but it was done by a guy who everybody thought had the most potential of any fighter in the whole damn sport. I mean, for God's sake, his nickname is The Prodigy. BJ Penn exploded onto the MMA scene in 2001 with his World Jiu Jitsu title and three straight first round KO wins before his first ever title fight against Jens Pulver at UFC 35. Despite being a massive favorite, Penn would come up short on that day, but it was still seen as an upset, a fluke. He would win his next two before going to a draw with Kyle Uno for the vacant lightweight title, thus sinking the division. Later that year, he would earn the Rumble on the Rock lightweight title by submitting Takanori Gomi, and then despite having no fights left on his contract, moved up to welterweight for the first time in his career and challenged the legendary Matt Hughes, who was now on his sixth UFC title defense. The man was on a 13 fight win streak and came into the bout 35 and three. Despite the fact everyone could clearly see Penn had the potential to be an all time great, nobody could have anticipated that he would take out Matt Hughes in the first round with a rear naked choke. The victory was massive. The hype behind Penn bigger than ever, but that whole contract situation would turn out to be a problem as BJ decided to take his talents to K1, thus being stripped of his welterweight title. The prodigy wouldn't see the octagon again for nearly two years and when he did return, lost a split decision title eliminator at welterweight to George St. Pierre, followed by a rematch with Hughes for the actual title. While Penn would carve his own legacy at 155 pounds, the rest of his efforts at welterweight would be failures, and he would never quite live up to that victory at UFC 46. Number 2. Holly Holm How could a champion not be promising when they KO'd the most dominant fighter in the entire sport at that point in time? Holly Holm was very much the underdog against Ronda Rousey at UFC 193, despite the fact she was unbeaten herself. The rowdy one had torn through 12 opponents getting the finish each and every time. She was on her seventh title defense. She had taken over the world. Joe Rogan was talking about her fighting Floyd Mayweather. She opened as a 13 to one favorite over home. I mean, that is outrageous. But at the time it seemed reasonable. Nobody even batted an eye. Holly only had two UFC fights up to that point. And sure, her striking pedigree was another level above what anyone else had in the division, but fans just couldn't see Rousey being beat. So of course, when she completely dominated Ronda in front of 56,000 plus in person, with another 1.1 million buying at home, yeah, the hype was massive for the new champ after her head kick KO victory. Hell, Lady Gaga was tweeting about the fight. That's a big deal. Lady Gaga does not tweet about a lot of fights. While it appeared a rematch with Rousey was obviously next and obviously going to make a ridiculous amount of money, the champ wasn't going to wait around for Ronda to return to fighting, and so against the wishes of nearly everyone, took a fight with Misha Tate. Holm was a 4-1 to favorite, so it appeared the danger of losing the Ronda Rousey rematch was minimal, but life has a way of just completely fucking everything up, and in the last minute of the fifth round, Tate would snatch the title away with a Hail Mary submission attempt. While Holly would see several more title fights in her career, she would never capture gold again. Number 1. Conor McGregor The potential of 2016 double champ Conor McGregor was immeasurable. The man had truly the entire world by the balls following his destruction of Eddie Alvarez at UFC 205. Despite this though, and 350 days as featherweight champ, 511 at 155 pounds, Conor would never see a single defense. To understand the promise though, the hype, let's talk about what he did. He came into the UFC as Cage Warriors double champ, fired off six straight wins with five finishes, TKO Chad Mendez to earn interim gold, and then KO the legend Jose Aldo to become featherweight champion. My god, what could he possibly do next? Well, like William Wallace and Braveheart, the win at home wasn't enough, he would invade 155 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> 
Championship weight. RDA was the champ and the target, but the fight would fall apart and Connor would take a record-breaking Nate Diaz detour for a couple fights. Now the biggest name in the history of mixed martial arts, Connor took the lightweight title at UFC 205 to become the double champ, and the possibilities were endless. A third title, multiple defenses in both divisions. Instead, we got an insane crossover boxing bout with Floyd Mayweather, which was admittedly cool, it just wasn't MMA. Ultimately, we wouldn't see the Notorious in the octagon for nearly two years after hoisting those titles up in the air at MSG, and by that time, both of them had been stripped. Following his loss to Habib at UFC 229, connor has been in and out of the cage sporadically, but it's been four years since he fought for a title, and his reigns as champion feel like a distant memory. I'm Bailey from Ember Round Point, and yes, we are finally here in our brand new office. Let's go check it out. Hey, what's up, everybody? Welcome to our MMA Challenge of the Week. Today, I'm joined by the greatest referee in the world, Mr. Mark Goddard. Would, I would punch him straight in the back of the fucking head. That's right, a brand new channel with brand new content. Welcome to Fight Front, the home of personality-driven MMA. Today, it's an MMA challenge where I take the worst rated UFC character in UFC Undisputed 3 all the way to the heavyweight championship of the world. And hey, it's me, Tommy Toehold, and I'm rolling around on a damn monitor. And I'm reacting to Colin McGregor. Make sure you scroll on down and hit subscribe because you do not want to miss all the new content coming your way on this brand new channel. Thanks for watching. Please give us a like and subscribe. We've got three new videos or more for you every single week. Let us know what you thought of the video in the comments below. Follow On Point MMA on Twitter and have yourself a wonderful day.